Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Nathan Builds Robots. Today I'm going to be going over all of my top tool and 3D printer recommendations for 2022. So if you're doing any holiday shopping, this is the video for you. Let's get started with my top 3D printer recommendations. This is a 3D printer review channel after all, and I've tested over 20 3D printers, so let me share with you what I think are the best 3D printers of 2022. I've lined up all of my favorite 3D printers behind me. I've got a couple up here, and a couple down here as well. So let's start with the smallest ones of the bunch. These are your budget entry-level printers, and this year we've really seen a resurgence of small 3D printers. The smallest and cheapest that I've tested is this Ender 2 Pro. It weighs in at around four and a half kilograms. It's extremely light and portable. So if you want to dip your toes into 3D printing, this is a great place to start. It's really small, light, and compact. And I've seen these on sale for as little as $99. Typically they're on sale for about 120, but either way, it's a really cheap entry point into 3D printing. This is something that's really easy to set up, run a couple of prints, and then fold it up and put it away when you're not using it. So it's not a huge space allocation like some of these other 3D printers are. Next up on my list is the Tronxy Crux. I tested this printer out a couple of months ago and I was really impressed with its solid build quality and relatively large print area. The print area on this machine is 180 by 180 millimeters, which is quite a bit of room, and this machine is extremely small and compact. It's even smaller and more compact than the Ender 2 Pro that we were just talking about, and it comes with some nice upgraded features. For starters, it comes with a 5015 blower fan. This will provide much more effective part cooling than whatever you get on the Ender 2 Pro. And its all metal rail system is a lot lower maintenance, so there'll be a lot less fiddling around to get this thing running than the Ender 2 Pro. All in all, this Tronxy X1 offers an excellent user experience with its colorful and responsive touchscreen interface and has an extremely compact form factor. I mean, this thing is just absolutely tiny, but it can produce really high quality prints just like the Ender 2 Pro. The print volume on this machine is 180 millimeters cubed, whereas on the Ender 2 Pro it's 160 by 160 by 180. Just to give you a visual comparison, this is the Ender 2 Pro's print area and this is the Tronxy Crux's print area. So you get quite a bit of extra space there. It also comes with this PEI print surface, which offers excellent part adhesion, and it's really easy to get parts off of it when you're done printing. It also has a direct drive extruder that's easier to load and unload, and it's got a filament runout detection sensor. So this thing is packed with a lot of thoughtful features, and it's only slightly more expensive than the Ender 2 Pro. This is another printer that I could definitely recommend for a beginner, because it's just so easy to set up and use. It might seem odd, but I'm jumping from these small printers right up to this giant printer behind me. This is the Artillery Sidewinder X2. The Artillery Sidewinder X2 has a 300 by 300 by 400 millimeter print volume. That's absolutely enormous. And just to give you some context for scale, I can print one of these on it. This is just like a gigantic blade thing. But you know, that's like a foot by a foot by a foot and a third. So that's really tall and big. Overall, it's an extremely high value printer. It only costs about $260, which is less expensive than a lot of printers that are half its size. And it's got a bunch of really awesome design features, like these ribbon cables that look a lot cleaner than the typical wire umbilical that you have on most 3D printers. It comes stock with a direct drive extruder, a bed leveling sensor, and an AC powered heated bed. This AC powered heated bed is a lot nicer than what you get on most other 3D printers because it can heat up in about a minute. If you look at a similar 3D printer that's this size, like the Ender 3 S1 Plus, that takes about five or six minutes to heat up the heated bed. So this responds a lot more quickly. When you tell it to print out something, it gets started right away. If I had to give one printer the award of printer of the year, it would be this Artillery Sidewinder X2 because it's coming in at an extremely low price for all the features they've packed onto this, and it's got everything that you'd expect of a modern 3D printer. So I would definitely give this Artillery Sidewinder X2 my top recommendation. I've printed out hundreds of objects with this thing, and it just works. And you really can't beat the price of this thing. I think it's on sale for about $250 right now for Black Friday, and even when it's not Black Friday, it's only about $270. So this is pretty much the deal of the year, and I can't recommend it enough. Check out my full video on the Artillery Sidewinder X2 if you want to learn more about it. So the Artillery Sidewinder is definitely the biggest and best 3D printer you can get for the money in 2022. 
But if you want to spend a little more, you can consider the Ender 5 S1. Creality just sent me this Ender 5 S1 for review, and I'm kind of surprised they actually sent me something. I mean, if they've watched any of my previous videos, they... Uh, well, let's not get into that right now. The main thing to know about this 3D printer is that it's the best 3D printer that Creality has ever made. It prints with excellent quality and is extremely fast compared to their Ender 3 lineup. When this thing's printing, you can just see it zipping around really fast and it's a sight to behold. I know there's other 3D printers out there like Vorons and Bamboo Labs and stuff that can probably print faster than this, but for a stock Creality machine that you can just order and put together in a day, this thing is simply one of the best printers that you can get. I'm going to release my initial review of this machine, so if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe. And I'll be doing some upgrades to this machine, which will take it to the next level, and it'll be a lot of fun. It's going to be a great video that you won't want to miss. It's got the same print bed size as an Ender 3, so you're not getting more print area, but you're getting more print speed and higher print quality. And although I haven't tested one, I've heard great things about the Bamboo Labs X1 Carbon, so if you're looking for a 3D printer above $1,000, that seems to be the printer to get. It's got crazy print speeds and takes a lot of the DIY element out of 3D printing. So if you've got a lot of money to burn and you just want something that prints, I would recommend checking out the Bamboo Labs X1 Carbon. The next thing I want to talk about is the tools that I use every day for my 3D printer mods and project videos. Now, I really like this torch. It's useful for a lot of things like melting plastic. Let's say you printed something out and it doesn't fit exactly into shape, so you need to bend it a little bit. Well, if you try to bend it, it'll probably break. But if you heat it up first, then it'll soften the plastic and allow you to mold it and get it to the right shape without having to remodel and reprint the entire thing. I mean, just take a look at this knife blade. Just hit it with the torch a little bit, and then you can... Okay, it needs a little more torch time. So just hit it with the torch, and then you can bend the plastic and bend it into a new shape, let it cool off, run it under some water, hold it in front of a fan or whatever, and once it's cooled off, it solidifies in that shape, and then you've quickly and easily modified your part. I can't tell you how many times this has come in handy in my 3D printer modding videos, so I could definitely recommend getting some kind of torch or heat gun to help with these types of modifications. And once this is cooled off, you've got like a 90 degree angle pokey thing, if that's what you need. The next thing that I've used in a ton of my videos is this Dremel. Learning how to use a Dremel is a hugely important skill when it comes to working with small and medium sized objects. With this little tool, you can cut anything, from 3D printed plastic, to wood, to hardened steel. It can all be defeated with a simple, small Dremel. Just watch this. Cuts right through that. It cut right through that, no problem. And here's some 5mm thick plywood. Check out what a Dremel can do to this 5mm thick plywood. It just sliced right through this thing in about five seconds. Being able to cut things like this that are made out of wood or plastic or metal, this is extremely useful for modifying and tweaking little objects. Add to that, it's got a pencil-like grip, so you can get in there and do really fine detailed work too. And with the variety of tool head options that you can put on here, you can do precision grinding, sanding, and finishing on all sorts of projects as well. So this is one of the most versatile hand tools that you can get. This right here is a Dremel 300. I tried some of the more expensive, larger Dremels, but I went back to the Dremel 300 because this thing is extremely cheap, it's lightweight, and its small size really helps out when you're doing finer, more detailed work. Being able to grab it and hold it without it weighing too much is a huge deal for ergonomics. There's similar rotary tools that are sold by other no-name brands. I would definitely recommend the Dremel 3000 because you get quality, reliability, and durability. I've been using this thing for five years, just hacking and slashing through all sorts of stuff, and it's been holding up great. Also, with Dremel, you're getting tried and true ergonomics. I've always found the grip to be comfortable and easy to use. Dremel also makes smaller tools and cordless tools, and I haven't tried those out, but I really like the amount of power that you get with something that's plugged into the wall. A small Dremel kit with the Dremel 3000 only costs about $60 or $70, so it's definitely worth picking one of these up if you don't already have one. One thing to keep in mind with these tools is that you're working in proximity to a sharp blade, so you just got to be really careful and make sure you're holding things securely. Don't let it run away from you, don't let it hit your hand. I mean, that's actually happened to me a couple of times, but I've got thick skin, so 
it just bounced off basically. You definitely can get injured with these kind of tools if you're not working with them safely. So remember kids, safety first. I also have a hacksaw and a drill that I use in a lot of my videos. Drills are handy for putting holes in things and also for fastening and unfastening things quickly. I'm not a big fan of this DeWalt drill. I've actually sliced my fingers on it a little bit because there's this weird gap in here. It just seems like it's not designed very well and it's kind of dangerous. So I would definitely recommend getting something from a different brand, maybe Milwaukee, I've heard they're pretty good, or Ryobi. Those are some nice brands. DeWalt is just kind of cheap crap, but that's what I use in my lab sometimes and this is what I use for most of my projects. And the hacksaw comes in handy when you need to cut through anything from aluminum to mild steel. You can cut through things extremely fast. Just make sure to use a little bit of cutting fluid and push down on it while you're cutting. And you can cut through a rebar in like a second with a sharp blade like this. You'll know you're doing it right if you see smoke coming off of the blade. Some of the other things that I find incredibly handy and I use on a daily or weekly basis are this soldering iron, these calipers, and this multimeter. So the calipers and multimeter are extremely important for getting correct measurements. If you're wanting to reverse engineer a part or trying to design something to fit on this fan or onto your 3D printer, being able to take accurate measurements is extremely important. You can also use it for calibrating your filament so you can measure the diameter of the filament. I'd highly recommend this Mitotoyo brand. This is definitely the best brand of calipers in the premium budget range. These you can find for $80 to $120. The level of precision that you get from these calipers is simply fantastic. Like if I go to zero, open it up, close it again, it returns to zero every time. I've had this pair of calipers for two years and it's got the original batteries in there and I'll just usually just leave it on. These things have just an absolutely crazy amount of battery life. So I really like these. I've designed all of my stuff using this pair of calipers. A multimeter is essentially the electrical equivalent to a nice pair of calipers. This will let you measure the voltage of certain wires. You can measure the amount of current flowing through things. You can check for continuity. Let's say you had a short circuit and you blew something up on your printer. This will be very useful for diagnosing exactly where the fault is. Also, you can reverse engineer electrical circuits using this tool. So it's an extremely handy tool. This is the one that I use. It cost me maybe $4. This is just a cheap one that I got, but it gets the job done. I'd like to invest in a nicer pair, maybe something from a brand like Fluke, but just some cheap no-name multimeter like this is all you really need, unless you need to make extremely accurate measurements. Frankly, I do enough electrical work that it warrants me getting a nicer multimeter, but this is the one that I use and it's been working just fine. Having a crappy multimeter like this is way better than having no multimeter at all. Otherwise, you're forced to lick the electrical terminals of a battery to detect how much voltage is left. And that's not very accurate and it kind of tastes bad. So I would definitely recommend getting something like this because it's really useful for designing, testing, and diagnosing all sorts of electrical systems. Just one tip for people who are new to using multimeters. If you're probing something that's really small, you have to be very careful not to cause a short with these pins. Meaning if you touch multiple objects at the same time, with this little test probe, you're gonna create a short and you can actually break your circuit doing that. So if you're not paying attention, it's very easy to do more harm than good when you're trying to figure out what's going on with an electrical circuit. Ask me how I know. But yeah, the only way to learn how to use these is to get your hands on and figure it out yourself. So just pick one of these up, try testing some things, check the voltage of a battery, check the resistance of a resistor, that kind of stuff. You'll get the hang of it and it'll be an extremely useful skill that you'll carry with you for the rest of your life. The other electrical tool that I really like using is this Hakko soldering iron. This is extremely useful for just making electrical connections, taking parts off of PCBs, putting them back on. When I built my first production run of these breakout boards, I did it all using this Hakko soldering iron. And I definitely recommend a good brand like Hakko or Weller because those companies have established themselves as producing very high quality, reliable goods. If you have a cheap soldering iron, the tips will get oxidized and wear out more quickly, or you won't get the correct temperature delivered to the soldering iron's tip. So having a high quality soldering iron from Weller or Hakko is definitely something that I would recommend picking up. This thing's been extremely useful for all my projects, and I couldn't imagine doing 3D printer mods without a soldering iron. Some things that you'll use less often, but are still extremely useful, 
are these wire crimping tools. You can use these to install your own crimped ferrule ends to enhance the electrical safety of your 3D printer. And you can make your own JST connectors. You can make stuff like this. There is a bit of a learning curve when it comes to figuring out how to use these crimping tools. But once you get the hang of it, you'll be able to make all sorts of electrical connectors and it's an extremely handy skill to have when you're working on electronics. All right, the next thing I wanna talk about are these little hand tools that I use all the time. If you get tired of using these tiny little Allen wrenches that come with your 3D printer, it might be time to pick up one of these. This is a screwdriver and it's got like this rotary chamber so you can change what bit you're using. You can change from a flat head to a Phillips head to a, flat, a different size flat head to a Torx bit. So you've just got all these options right at your fingertips for undoing different screws on your 3D printer. This one also has a ratcheting head built in so you just twist it back and forth and it's turning forwards and you can reverse it to turn backwards or you can lock it. So you've got a lot of options with this thing. And I think this one uses a little roller bearing clutch so you don't hear any clicking. It's just nice and smooth and it's really ideal for these small fasteners that you find on a lot of 3D printers. It even has in-handle storage for some extra bits. This screwdriver only came with Torx bits, Phillips, and flathead. It doesn't have any hex heads like what you get on a normal Allen wrench. But if you get your own bits and put them in here, then that'll work just as well. To change bits, you can just pull them out here and put a new one in. So you can have fast access to your eight most commonly used bit types. I think I picked this up for around 12 bucks. So it's a really small investment, but it's really handy for all sorts of things on a 3D printer. Now a note about using torque spits on hex heads. It works out great for all of the larger size bits. So for instance, this larger torque spit works just fine on all of my 3D printer hex head fasteners. But if you go down to these really small torque spits, they don't work so well as hex head fasteners. So you might wanna pop in some different bits here or just fall back to using your small Allen wrenches when you need to do really small screws, like set screws and stuff like that. But overall, I use this on 80% of the fasteners on my 3D printers and it works great. Another tool that I really like to use is this chamfer slash deburring tool. So um, if I need to put a hole in one of my 3D prints, I can just easily drill it in there by hand. So just like that, you can drill through even relatively thick plastic pretty easily to add holes. It also puts a nice chamfered edge on there. So if you're gonna be putting some flat head screws in, those will sit nice and flush and they'll make good contact with the part. Also, you can change the end out to use a deburring tool like this. So deburring tools are used for breaking the edges off of parts. So if you've got a sharp edge, you can just kinda shave it off. It works pretty much like a potato peeler and you can just break down all of these sharp corners and make it pleasant to, uh, to handle. This is great for when you print parts like flat against the build surface and then it's got kind of a sharp corner along the bottom there. Just pop that off, round that edge down. So this is a great tool to have for post-processing. The next category of hand tools are for gripping and grabbing. My favorite by far are these Nipex pliers. I've got these water pipe pliers and also these wrench pliers. These Nipex water pipe pliers are super aggressive and you can grab on to pretty much anything with them and they just won't let go. They also have a ton of grip strength. The only downside is they can mar the surface a little bit because they've got kind of an aggressive texture up on the jaws. One of the best features about these is how adjustable they are. So here you can see it's clamping down all the way, but we can open this up and now it's got an extremely wide grip. So even something really big like this uh, torch, I can just grab onto it. They sell these in all shapes and sizes. I find that the seven inch one works the best. Same with the wrench pliers. They sell these in all sorts of sizes and they have a huge range of adjustment. They work really well for anything that you don't wanna mar up. So I'll use these when I'm grabbing nozzles or heater blocks. These nice flat parallel jaws will do a good job of not damaging things but they'll also get a nice strong grip on them. Then the most useful pair of pliers that I have for all these 3D printer related projects are these Weller pliers. These are miniature needle nose pliers and I think they just work great. I don't know if these are the miniature needle nose or the regular needle nose. Either way, these are just simply fantastic for getting in there, grabbing things. 
they automatically spring open so it's really easy to just like get into a crack, grab what you need and pull it out. Or for plugging and unplugging wires in tight spaces, these are just extremely handy. I also have these bigger and longer Nipex long nose pliers. These are handy on occasion, they've got some nice cutting teeth there and they're really long. So if there's something stuck way down in a hole, you can just get in there and grab it and pull it out. And these are super strong as well. That's one thing about all these Nipex tools is they're extremely well built and strong. So they make great gifts because they're just high quality tools that you'll keep with you forever. The next category that I want to cover is 3D printer upgrades. So one thing that you might know about my channel is that I really don't like fan noise. If I turn a 3D printer on and it starts making a ton of fan noise, I absolutely hate that. So one of the first things that I'll do to upgrade my 3D printers is replace the loud noisy fans with some silent Noctua fans. Noctua produces the best small silent fans on the market. So if you want to quiet your printer down, I definitely recommend getting some of these. And in particular, I recommend this exact one. This is a NF-A4X20 FLX. This is a three pin fan. And the nice thing about it is that it comes with two low voltage adapters. And if you take both of those low voltage adapters and plug them in in series, it allows you to plug that directly into your 3D printer on a 24 volt circuit, despite these being 12 volt fans. And it should work. I haven't actually tested this out and verified it yet, but if you get this exact kind, you'll at least get those two low voltage adapters in the box that'll allow you to experiment and see if you can get your fan noise down using those little extras. Also, I've noticed a lot of people complaining about how expensive these fans are. I actually think they're an incredible value because they're the best performing fans on the market. They're super quiet and you get all these little accessories in the box with them. So this is just a list of all the little accessories that you get. And these are extremely useful for when you're installing them. Just having those extra wires and adapters and cables and stuff just makes it that much easier for doing your 3D printer mods. So what, you're spending an extra $5, but you're getting all those extra little tools in there to help you do your installation. Plus you end up with higher quality fans that objectively look better. I mean, everybody loves this brown and tan color scheme, right? So I definitely recommend these Noctua fans. I've also got one of these 40 by 10. So this is just an even smaller fan that, you know, you can get one of those and play with it if you want. But overall, I'm a huge Noctua fanboy. I mean, I'm a big fan of their fans. So I've bought probably 20 to 40 Noctua fans and I keep buying them because they're just so high quality, so quiet and so good for silent 3D printer applications that they're pretty much the only thing on the market that's worth buying. The next upgrade that I'd recommend is an all metal heat break. So these are heat breaks. That's the little part of the 3D printer that separates the hot end from the cold parts of the printer. And these are really important. Basically, you wouldn't be able to have a 3D printer without one of these because you'd never be able to get your extrusion to behave correctly. A lot of printers come with a PTFE lined heat break, which means you've got PTFE tubing, which is Teflon, and it goes right into the hot part of the 3D printer. Now the problem there is that this PTFE is getting heated up to the same temperature as your hot end. And if you heat PTFE up above 240 degrees, it starts releasing toxic gases. So that's something that I personally would really like to avoid, which is why I always replace my PTFE lined hot ends with all metal hot ends. So I'm doing an install on this one right here. That's why it's taken apart. But basically all you need to do is disassemble this bit of the printer take out the old hot end and put one of these all metal replacements in. It's a really simple upgrade and it'll allow you to print high temperature materials safely. I can only recommend using a PTFE lined hot end if you're only gonna be printing PLA or other low temperature plastics. But if you wanna print anything like PETG, ABS, nylon, carbon filled nylon, you're definitely gonna to wanna to upgrade to an all metal hot end. I dislike how a lot of companies are still shipping PTFE lined hot ends. I think it's careless and they just need to go ahead and make the upgrade for everyone's sake. It's not too difficult of an upgrade to do on your own. So I'd recommend just getting the all metal hot end upgrade and upgrading whatever 3D printers that you have because it's a safety thing and it also unlocks the ability to use higher temperature filaments, which increases your capabilities too. So here's your typical part cooling fan that you'll find on a 3D printer. This is a 4010 blower fan. It's a small fan that produces a decent amount of airflow, but it's not the most high performance fan on the market. 
This is the generally accepted upgrade that most people will go with. This is a 5015 blower fan. So it's a little bit thicker and it's a little bit bigger, but these things move a lot more air than the 4010 fans. So by upgrading to one of these, you're going to get much better part cooling, which will let you cool your prints off faster and also allow you to print with steeper overhangs and longer bridges. So it just increases your print speeds and capabilities of your 3D printer dramatically. So it's definitely worth installing one of these on your 3D printer. Now to install this, you're going to want to look up a fan shroud that's designed for your 3D printer. So just go on Thingiverse or Thangs or whatever website you use to look up 3D models and then download a fan shroud, print it out, and then install this onto your 3D printer. And that should unlock a lot more capabilities for your machine. You can also go to an even bigger size fan, but once you get up to this size, you're adding all this extra weight to the hot end, which is gonna slow down your print speeds instead of speed them up. So you're kind of past the point of diminishing returns. Most of the time, a 5015 part cooling fan is all you need. Another one of my favorite upgrades are these Bontech CHT nozzles. Through my own independent testing, I showed that you can pretty much double your print speeds on a printer like the Ender 3S1 just by upgrading the nozzle to one of these CHTs. The improvement that these Bontech CHT nozzles have is this three-lobed intake design, and that splits up the filament and lets it heat up faster. So you can put down more plastic more rapidly. Bontech also recently came out with these Volcano CHT nozzles. So it's got the same three-lobed intake, but it's got a longer melt zone which helps heat up the plastic to a more uniform temperature and it just basically speeds up print rates even more. I'm going to be installing this Volcano CHT nozzle on my Ender 5 S1 and I'm going to be pushing some insane print speeds with it. So I'm really looking forward to that. The nice thing about these nozzle upgrades is they're really easy to do. All you have to do is unscrew the old nozzle and put the new one in and just like that you've increased your print speeds. So it's really kind of low hanging fruit when it comes to 3D printer upgrades. Now generally I don't advise replacing the heater block and heater cartridge and thermistor on your 3D printer just because that stuff is a lot of trouble to mess with. But if you're having compatibility issues or you broke your old setup, I would definitely recommend these Triangle Labs CHC hot ends. In this one small package we have a heating element, a thermistor, and the heater block. And it's all just kind of built into this small little thing. And you put the sock over the top and there you go. You just put this on your 3D printer and it's a lot less hassle to deal with than the traditional heater block designs. If we look at the heater block on this Tronxy Crux, I'm not picking on Tronxy here. Most 3D printers use this kind of heater block design. This is significantly smaller. So it's smaller, lighter, it heats up faster, and it just seems like a better overall design. And I'm a big fan of these because when I install one of these, it simplifies the whole hot end assembly for my 3D printer which is just makes things easier to work with. So I definitely recommend these CHC hot ends. That stands for ceramic heater core. And this white part is actually ceramic. So that's where they get the name from. And the last 3D printer upgrade that I'd recommend is if you have an Ender 3 S1 or any of the S1 printers, Ender 5 S1, whatever, I'd recommend picking up one of these breakout boards that I designed. The Ender 3s used to be some of the most moddable 3D printers on the market. But with their new Sprite hot end design, they went to all these little proprietary connectors. I made a whole video about it. You can check it out if you want. But I developed this breakout board to get around all those proprietary connectors and bring back all of the old school connectors. And that way, when I buy a fan like this, it comes with the two pin JST connector, which is like the industry standard for this kind of thing. I can just plug it directly into my modder board and it's going to fire up as if it was wired for it. So I'm just making the Ender 3 S1 and the Ender 5 S1 compatible with what's commonly on the market. It just makes upgrading a 3D printer a lot easier and more fun, which is the way that it should be. My next edition of the board will have some nice upgrades on it. There's going to be a spot so you can wire in your own current limiting resistor, which will allow you to run Noctua fans directly off of the board. You're not going to have any kind of weird inline voltage adapters. It's all going to be wired in to the PCB. Also, I figured out what connector Creality was using for that latching connector that just like plugs in and has the little arms that come in from the sides. I found a source for those, so the next version of the board will have those latching connectors built in, and it'll be much easier to plug in and unplug than my previous edition of the board. 
The new boards will be black and gold, but they won't be matte black and gold like these ones, and the wires will be slightly different, but overall it'll have more features and I think it'll be a good upgrade. So if you want to learn more about my modder board, check out my videos on that or head over to my website, nathansellsrobots.com, and you can order one for yourself. The last thing that I'd recommend picking up if you're doing a lot of 3D printing and 3D printer mods is to buy a bunch of these fasteners. Just having M3 fasteners and all the common bolts and nuts is just really handy when you're making things because you don't have to put your project on hold whenever you need to find a fastener. Also, I lose fasteners on my 3D printers all the time. They just fly off into the ether. So having a box of replacements is always handy. And most of the fasteners on a 3D printer are an M3 size. I do want to bring up laser cutters for a minute. This is the Oter Laser Master 3. I just recently filmed a video about this. I'll be releasing it soon. But this is one of the best laser cutters on the market. I could highly recommend this Oter Laser Master 3. It's just got an impressively slim design and it just was a lot easier to use than a lot of the other laser cutters that I've tested out before. So check those out. I'll leave a link in the description to that as well. Just make sure to be safe, wear your laser safety glasses, and I actually got an enclosure for my laser cutter and an air filter. So um, that all helps to make things a little bit safer as well. This is the fume extractor that I was using for my laser cutter. So you just turn this on and it'll just pull whatever smoke out of the air. Just suck stuff in here and kind of takes care of the smoke. I don't think it has a true HEPA filter. It was, uh, I can actually smell the smoke that's coming out the other end of this machine. So it wasn't filtering all of it out. I might have to find a replacement filter for that. But um, in addition to having a fume extractor like that, I would recommend getting a HEPA air filter like this one. This is my Lavoit air filter. I've got like four of these scattered around my house. And I keep one next to my 3D printers when they're running just to filter out the microplastics and stuff that are generated when you're 3D printing. If you can smell something, then that means there's particles in the air. So if you can smell your 3D printer when it's running, you should probably be filtering that air. Also, I have one of these just in case. You know, you can just put one of these on whenever you're running your 3D printer. That's uh, the safest way to go. But in all seriousness, that mask comes in handy a lot more often than you'd think. If you're ever spray painting things or working with volatile organic compounds that evaporate, having something like that to just filter out the air is super handy. Of course, you want to do your best to work in a well-ventilated area and all that, but having an extra layer of protection always helps. I also have a hazmat suit, you know, those white suits that you put on to work with hazardous materials. I've got one of those too, but uh, yeah, when I get that on in the hazmat suit, I feel like I'm ready for anything. Safety glasses too are a big plus. I don't wear them all that often, but it's good to have them when you need them. All right, and the last thing I wanna cover is filmmaking equipment and things that I use for producing these videos that you all love to watch. <laughs> the biggest improvement that I've made to my YouTube channel's quality is in my audio equipment. So if you listen to some of my earlier videos, so in today's episode, I'll be showing you how to make your printer run whisper quiet. It sounds like nails on a chalkboard. My voice doesn't come through very well, and you can hear all sorts of echoes and bad sound quality. So what I did to fix that was I got some of these Rode microphones. This is the Rode Wireless Go 2, and this allows me to run a two microphone setup. So if I'm doing a factory tour where things are loud, or if I wanted to do an interview with someone, I can slap one of these on myself, put one on the other person, and then I get great audio quality and I can switch back and forth between the microphones so you can hear both of us while we're talking. Having the microphone as close to the body and to the voice as possible helps cut down all the external noise and just increases the sound quality immensely. And this is one thing that I'm really glad I bought for my YouTube channel. When it comes to video editing, something that was instrumental for me to be able to release more videos more quickly is this MacBook Pro. This is a MacBook Pro 16 inch. And I got this because I heard a lot of reviews about it being really good at editing video and all that kind of stuff. So I bought one of these and it's completely reinvented my workflow when it comes to editing videos. You'll see me on here just like, you know, rapidly making cuts, moving footage around and doing it all through shortcuts on the keyboard. My old video editing setup was this desktop PC that I built about eight years ago. It was pretty nice back then, but it's really starting to show its age. And when I was trying to edit video, it would take forever. I couldn't edit 4K on that machine because it would just be too slow. 
I would click something and I'd have to wait like 30 seconds for it to update. Having a nice editing laptop like this was instrumental in me being able to edit that kind of footage. I used to do all my videos in 1080p, but even that was running really slow on that computer. So editing 4K and HD footage on this computer is just like crazy difference. When I'm scrubbing through the timeline and doing all my edits, everything updates pretty much instantly. And when it comes time to export my videos on my old computer, it would take like two plus hours to export a 20 minute video. On this machine, if I'm editing in 4K and I produce a 20 minute video, it only takes about 10 minutes to export. So if I notice any issues in the video, it's really easy for me to go back, make changes and re-export it. It was really frustrating when I was using this other machine because it takes like two hours to export the video. And if anything goes wrong during that two hours, let's say the computer goes to sleep or it gets to some point in the timeline and it just can't compile and it just restarts the whole thing. I end up wasting tons of hours because I usually start compiling the video overnight and then I check on it in the morning and well, it didn't work. Well, now I have to wait another day to release my video. Something like this where everything just happens super snappy is awesome. Also, it's got a great screen and speakers and microphone and all that stuff is really useful for when you're editing or filming content. And the SD card over here is what I use to upload my 3D prints to an SD card. So just being able to plug that in, put my G-code on the SD card and then plug it into the printer, that's all worked out really well for me. My only complaints about this machine is there's no USB-A port. That's kind of annoying, but I just bought a bunch of these. This is a USB-C to USB-A adapter and I just leave these plugged into all of my USB cords around the house. And the other thing is you can't upgrade the RAM or memory on these machines because it's all soldered onto the board. So to upgrade my storage space, I've got one of these Samsung SSDs on the back. This is like a special fast hard drive, but they're on sale right now. It's only about $150. And you can get one of these, store two terabytes of data. I kind of treat this as a storage drive, but it's fast enough that I can actually edit video off of it. So it's a really fast drive. When I'm trying to clear out my hard drive to make room for a new project, I can just drag and drop my files over to this hard drive and it can transfer 100 gigabytes in a couple minutes. So that speed is incredibly handy because I can just offload those files and if I need to drag them back in, I can pull them back in. My old hard drive was just a regular USB, you know, spinning disk drive. I like to archive my footage, so when I wanted to drag my whole project off and put it on that hard drive just to temporarily keep it in case I need to change anything later. It would take several hours to do that file transfer. So that's again a time where I just have to stop what I'm doing and just let it transfer the files. All that stuff ends up wasting your time and when you can spend more time editing and creating content that's when you're going to be producing the most value for yourself and your viewers. Also this touchpad is simply amazing compared to anything that I've used on a Windows laptop. It's like space age technology. I never have issues clicking on the stuff that I need to click on or dragging and dropping and all that kind of stuff. So um, big fan of this MacBook. And probably the most important thing for me with this MacBook is that it doesn't run my favorite video games. So when uh, I'm editing a video, it's harder for me to find distractions and being like, oh, I wanna play this game. Nope, I gotta, I gotta do my video editing when I'm on this machine. So it helps me stay focused and that's been hugely beneficial for my productivity too. For camera gear, I've switched over to using Sony Alpha cameras. Initially, I was using Canon cameras, but um, one of them ended up breaking when it came unplugged at the wrong time. And I'm like, come on, Canon, you can't even prevent your devices from completely crashing and breaking down when you unplug it at an inopportune time. That's kind of BS. The Sony camera that I'm using now has a bunch of really awesome features. It's the a7 IV. I'd highly recommend that if you're looking for a nice camera for photography and taking videos. It's got great autofocus. I can record indefinitely when I'm plugged in with a USB cord like this. Uh, it's, it's got like really high quality 4K video. So it's just been really fun to use and um, it's way better than the Canon gear that I was using before. It's got image stabilization, all sorts of crazy stuff that it just makes everything look a little bit nicer. And I hope you guys on the other end of the camera really appreciate that extra image quality that I can deliver. The other thing that I find handy, especially for this type of electronics and uh, 3D printing content that I do, is having a thermal camera. So this is the FLIR 1. I bought this a while ago, but it's still one of the best on the market. I'd recommend the FLIR 1 Pro. The nice thing about it is it's got a higher resolution thermal image, which really helps you see what's going on. 
I mean, some of these low resolution thermal cameras, it looks like you're just like looking at a blurry blob of jello. You can't really tell what you're looking at. With this one, it's got sufficient resolution to see exactly what's going on on which component is overheating and which wire is too hot and what part of your 3D print is getting cooled off. So it's just really cool to add in those thermal camera visuals. So if you just wanted to know what I use around my office or are you looking for any holiday gift buying advice for someone in your life that might have similar interests as me? These are all the 3D printers, tools, and gear that I use on a daily basis. Hopefully I've been able to give you some ideas of what the good stuff on the market is and uh, this is all stuff that I use all the time and I thoroughly enjoy using. And if you've got someone in your life that likes to 3D print a lot, the one thing that you can always get them is just more filament. All right, well, we're coming up on the holidays. I hope everyone has an opportunity to spend some time with their families, with their pets, and just has a good holiday season. I want to give a huge thanks to all my subscribers, all my patrons, and everyone who's bought one of my breakout boards. You guys are really helping support the channel, and it really inspires me to produce more content and upgrade my gear so I can give you the best quality video and audio and more stuff. So yeah, from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys for watching. It's crazy to think that there's over 10,000 subscribers to the channel already. Hopefully you guys stick around and you watch my video about the Ender 5 and my video about the Otur LaserMaster 3. And we've got a lot of other cool stuff coming up for next year. So uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.